Good morning. Welcome to Worship with First Presbyterian Church, Georgetown, Texas. I am Bobby Holm Lippert, pastor here, and I recognize this particular setting is not at all familiar to any of us. This is not uh, the Fellowship Hall, the worship center where we're used to opening our services of worship. Uh, but as many of you know, with the storms last week, we had a portion of our fire sprinkler system uh, burst and had a good bit of water go into the Fellowship Hall Worship Center area, as well as the, the, the kitchen there and some of the Sunday school classrooms and hallways behind that whole area. Uh, of course, that means we, we cannot be there and, and use that space right now. Our property committee, our session, our staff are working diligently to figure out what the next steps are as far as uh, making sure we have a full assessment of the damage, uh, working on the, the repairs, the timelines, all that. And as we have more information, that will be known to you. Again, what it means for today is we're not recording, we're not live streaming from the Fellowship Hall. In fact, the whole of this particular service this Sunday is pre-recorded. Uh, nevertheless, so grateful that you are here on this uh, on this Sunday, this first Sunday in Lent. A couple things to uh, remind you about. Uh, one, you can sign in for this service of worship. Let us know you're here and we'd love for you to do that, whether you're a longtime member, first time visitor, just go to the front page of our website, fpcgeorgetown.org, click in the upper right hand corner on uh, worship online and wait a moment or two and a little form will pop up and you can fill that in and we will uh, certainly for those of you who are signing up for the newsletter for the first time or, or input more information we'll be sure to follow up with you. Uh, we are continuing in our series Words of Life in the Wilderness, a sermon series where we're exploring the Ten Commandments as God's word to us in a real season of wilderness uh, on multiple levels. Part of this series has been uh, doing the sermon from different parts of the church's property. Uh, parts of and, and those parts of the property are meant to accent something about the commandment that we're exploring. Unfortunately, for this uh, particular week, I was not able to get over to the property and record in a special location, but we'll, we'll certainly come back around to that in the coming weeks. Also a reminder, those of you who are members received burlap crosses, little square burlap crosses in the mail. They were going to be incorporated into our Ash Wednesday service, which did not take place over Zoom on Ash Wednesday. And so we're going to incorporate those burlap crosses into a prayer litany during the prayers of the people in this service. And so I do invite you to have those um, uh, burlap squares with you, if, if again, if you still have that couple of things to know in the life of our congregation. Please do be in prayer for the family of Lieutenant General Charles Graham, Chuck. Uh, he went to be with our Lord. Back on February 11th, uh, he of course was a member of First Presbyterian Church from 1999 to 2018. And again, um, welcome prayers for his family in this time. Congratulations are also in order to Steve and Teresa Wilson on the birth of their grandson, Parker Cole Risotto, on February 16th. Their daughter, Chessa, and family are all doing well, and we are grateful and rejoice alongside them. Congratulations again. Let us now continue in the worship of our God, who is faithfully with us no matter where we have gathered on this morning.
please join me in our call to worship. We are here to praise the God of love. We are here to bow before the God whose love surpasses all knowledge. We are invited by God to be rooted and grounded in love. We praise the God whose love dwells in our hearts. We come to worship the God who gives us the fullness of life. Let us worship the God whose love knows no bounds. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession, followed by a few moments of silent confession. Gracious and patient God, how quickly our tempers take hold, how easily our anger is kindled. Amid the challenges of our lives and this world, we are prone to use hurtful, ugly words against one another. Even when we remain silent, we often harbor malice and disdain. We confess, too, that we are too often callous and in times when lives are unjustly taken. Forgive us. Holy Spirit, bathe us in your mercy and renew us with your love and patience. Friends, hear these words from Scripture. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast mercy. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Thanks be to God. Amen. kids. It's Miss Stephanie. By now you guys probably know that we're studying together as a church the Ten Commandments that God gave his people many years ago. This week we're on the Sixth Commandment, which simply says, you shall not murder. 
no murder. That's easy, right? It's easy to remember, and it's usually pretty easy to not murder somebody. So are we done with that commandment? Can we move on? Or is there something more to this one? Actually, in the New Testament, Jesus talks about this commandment and the something more in Matthew 5. When Jesus says in Matthew, do not murder, he also teaches his followers not to hate or be angry toward others. He even taught them that they are to love their enemies, even if they're annoying or wrong, or if their enemies are bullies who don't honor others. Jesus taught us that we can do more than not hurt or kill. How can we, how can we do that? Maybe we can do the opposite. Maybe we can care for people's needs. Maybe we can show them when we talk to them that they matter to us. Maybe we can treat them as though God himself made them, because he did. Jesus' teaching reminds us that it's important to honor others when we talk to them, or even when we think about them in our minds, to remember that God made those people. When we remember Jesus, we remember there can be a lot more to this commandment than just no murder. Can you guys think of any particular kinds of people that need protecting and honoring who aren't valued in our world? Can you think of any people who need protecting and honoring who can't protect themselves? Maybe even some people who've needed protecting this week during the storms? It's a pretty big job to look out for ourselves, but it's also a very important job from the Lord to look out not only for what interests us, but also to keep an eye out for our neighbors and to value their lives too, just as much as ours. I want to share a book that I love called Shelter that's about this very thing. And not only in our children's moment today, but in our sermon too. I hope that you will listen for what God has to say and see if someone or something comes to mind that you can write down or draw out as sermon art. It's morning. As the day stirs, the animals do too. Some slowly, some gently, while others go leaping out of bed. Over breakfast, everyone catches up on the latest news. A storm is coming. There's no time for panic. Together, the animals all set out to work, gathering wood, squirreling away food, quieting fears. They must be prepared. At last, everything is ready, and everyone braces for the storm. The wind begins to pick up. But all is well, the animals are safe and sound in their homes. What if others are still outside? Asks Little Fox. In the distance, two figures emerge from the fog, the wind howling around them. Everyone watches from their windows and wonders, Who are these strangers? What are they doing here? What do they want? Hmm. Soon they come knocking. The wind is cold. In exchange for some tea, could we warm ourselves by your fire? Our fire is out. Try next door. Our bellies are empty. In exchange for some tea, could we have a few cookies for dipping? We have no food. Try next door. The night is dark. In exchange for some tea, could we take comfort in the light of your hearth? Our den is small and crowded. Try next door. But next door, there's only a hill. That's all right, says Big Brother. Maybe the hill is more welcoming. As the bears set off, leaning on each other and into the wind, a voice rings out from behind. Wait, calls Little Fox. He's found something to share after all. You can't eat it. It's not as warm or nearly as bright as a fire. But it's still generous, says Big Brother. Thank you. On the hill, the night grows colder, so cold that the wind turns white. Big Brother holds out his hand. Little Brother sticks out his tongue. Soon the ground is blanketed in soft white snow. Big brother and little brother look at each other and smile. They'll be just fine. But there's danger in the fox den. The snowfall is so heavy it becomes more threatening than the wind. The roof folds and twists ready to give way. Quickly, everyone out, shouts Father Fox. What will they do now? It's so cold, says Mother. It's so dark, says Father. Look, says little fox, I see a light. As the foxes approach, the scent of ginger and cinnamon fills the air. Closing their eyes and taking deep breaths, they follow their noses and finally reach the curious light. The snow is still falling. The wind is still blowing. Little Fox steps forward and shouts. 
The wind is cold and the night is dark. In exchange for some cookies, would you share your shelter with us? The lantern light is weakening. Our den is small and crowded, and we have nothing to eat, says Big Brother. But our tea will warm you better than any fire. And with your cookies for dipping, it will be delicious. Come in, come in. And that is how two strangers came to share their humble shelter on a stormy winter's night when the moon could not be seen. Let's pray. Lord, please lead us to honor others, to look out for them, and to love them as people that you have made. We pray because of Christ. Amen. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 13. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not murder. Jesus, thy boundless love to Thought can reach, no tongue declare. I need my thankful heart to thee, and reign without our rival there. Thine only, thine alone, I live myself to. We are doing a sermon series on the Ten Commandments. These ten words of God might be thought of as God's answers to some of life's biggest questions. Each week, we will have a question asked in the service of worship by one of the children in the congregation, and then that question will help us explore one of the Ten Commandments in the sermon. Our hope is that this weekly question is a reminder to all of us that it is often by way of questions that children and adults alike best grow in the faith. And frequently, it is the children who ask the best questions. Is it really better to give than it is to receive? Our second reading comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. And in this passage, Jesus is unpacking the heart of the sixth commandment, do not murder. Importantly, when he speaks of anger in this passage, he is speaking of the, the kind of anger that is ongoing and continual. Hear now the word of our Lord. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, 
if you remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on your way to court with him, where your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid every last penny. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is something wonderful about that first dusting of snow. There's even something invigorating about plunging your hand into that first couple of inches and feeling instantaneously this fresh sensation of, of, of being alive. There is, the, the cold has something about it that almost jolts us awake. And I wonder if that isn't the same for anger. The great reformer Martin Luther once said, I find nothing promotes work better than angry fervor. For when I wish to compose, write, preach, and pray well, I must be angry. It refreshes my entire system. My mind is sharpened and all unpleasant thoughts and depression fade away. Luther speaks of anger as if someone just threw him into the snow as an entire, and his entire being has been awakened with, with fervor and sharpness and productivity. More recently, the 20th century novelist and Presbyterian minister Frederick Beekner said of anger, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll your tongue over the prospect of bitter confrontations still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. For Beekner, anger is not only productive, it is really quite delightful in its own bitter way. Still more recently, again, I came across a leading political strategist and professor who summarized the essence of good campaigning in our contemporary politics. He put it this way, if you can map an electorate's fears, if you can figure out what the people's deepest fears are, if you can map an electorate's fears and then turn those fears into anger by moralizing your opponent's sin, they will show up at the polls. Anger is not only productive, anger is not only delicious, but, but if you can find a way to throw a people into the soul and awaken that angry moral indignation, you will get the votes. Anger is power. And on top of all of that, anger is biblical. I mean, we can readily point to times in scripture where God is, is angered at sin. The prophets are, are angered at sin. Jesus, he's angry in, in the temple when he sees this house of worship being used to turn prophets. And so he overturns the tables, right? It's anger he uses to awaken others to, to their sin and to the injustice and to the need for change. All this to say, there is much to commend and anger's ability to, to jolt us awake, to invigorate, to enliven us to what and who matters. But the thing about snow is that for as wonderful and invigorating as it can be at first, it can quickly also become dangerous. As you all well know, Central Texas just does not have the infrastructure to deal with massive snowfall all over the roads. But, but of course, if at all possible, you do want to clear that snow as soon as possible because in these temperatures, that fluffy snow very quickly becomes this heavy, concretized, and, and quite dangerous sheet of ice. 
as you all saw in recent days. Same. If at all possible, you want to clear anger before it does the same with the human heart or even a human community. Let anger sit for a while and it will harden. It does calcify. And then across the hardened ice of anger, we find our words race forth all the faster. They flow forth more furiously. They, they speed forth and they hit with more impact. And it's not long before anger has caused a full-on crash with someone or someone's intentionally or unintentionally. And as some of us well know, the resultant damage and pain of those crashes can be very long-term. I find it telling that when Jesus addresses this commandment, the sixth commandment, do not murder, he doesn't go into all kinds of detail about warfare and bloodshed. He talks about anger. You've heard that it was said to, to people long ago, you shall not murder. Anyone who murders is, is liable to, to judgment. I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. Jesus recognizes the way that anger rips apart relationships and communities and churches and even countries, and it's essentially akin to murder. And I wonder if all the pain and destruction caused by anger is in itself the form of judgment Jesus speaks of in our passage. Beekner, when writing about uh, just how delicious the meal of anger is, that meal that's fit for a king, he concludes his thoughts this way. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down, this feast of anger you are having, the chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Or put another way, our angry words, our angry ways, they skid right across that hardened ice and we inevitably cause untold damage in that direction while also blowing up our own vehicle in the process. And so again, we are wise to shovel the snow quickly. Prayer to God, confession to God, praying some of the, the Psalms, praising God in song, talking with, with, with a trusted friend, about the mounting anger in our hearts. All of these and more are the tried and true ways to shovel the anger, lest it stick around beyond its momentary helpful purpose. The problem, I think, is that we live in a time in our nation where anger is so prevalent everywhere. The news, social media, extended family meals, editorials, campaigns, and in that kind of climate, snow hardens to ice so quickly, even if we didn't want it to or mean for it to. In our current climate, I think this has happened across the board for folks in the church, folks outside the church, and I think then one of the more urgent questions in our time is this. Aside from more and more carnage, aside from devouring ourselves and one another, what other option is there? I mean, what, what can actually change anything in our family or our relationship or our country at this point? What can actually make a difference in all of these hearts now hardened by, by layers of, of anger and resentment and even hatred? Salt. 
salt melts ice. Here's how Jesus describes what it looks like when somebody pours salt on ice. So when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember a brother or sister has something against you, leave the gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to that brother or that sister, then come and offer your gift. This is what being salt looks like in the world for Jesus in a very practical way. Even if you have, you believe you have something very important, even sacred to do, like making an offering for worship, leave it. First priority, go. Be reconciled with someone who has something against you. To that question, is it enough to just do no harm, to, to, to not be angry? Not for Jesus. Here, here we see he exhorts not, not just, so stop being angry, stop hurting anyone if you're being angry or any of that. But, but, but he says, no, actually, actually proactively seek the good of one who has something against you, one who holds a grudge against you, one who does not like you or something about you, one who is frustrated by you. Go and be reconciled with that person. Put another way, as Jesus does actually shortly after today's passage in the Gospel of Matthew, love your enemy. That is salt. I imagine we'd like Jesus to say more here, more, more details about this reconciliation process, other actions we might choose to take given how difficult and maybe even unlikely reconciliation would be. But the simple fact of it is this, salt melts ice. And the most potent salt of all is love for those who have something against you. Love for those that you have something against. Love for enemies. Praying for them, blessing them against all odds and perhaps with, with slim chances for success, seeking reconciliation with them. That is salt. And that's hard. At times, depending on the history or the context or the climate, honestly, pouring salt feels like an impossible task. Which makes me mindful of the other thing that melts ice, light. If there is anyone who's utterly justified in holding on to and concretizing their righteous anger, it is God. As God looks upon us and our failure to, to reflect God faithfully in this world, as God looks upon our sin, And yet scripture declares this, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet frozen, bound, and unyielding in our ways, in our hatred, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Which is to say, instead of holding on to and concretizing this, this righteous anger, God and Christ Jesus sought reconciliation. He went to the cross, and upon our frozen hearts, he poured forth the light of life and forgiveness that we, his enemies, might be reconciled. One of the central re reasons we place crosses at the center of our sanctuaries is because it reminds us that we gather under, we stand under the continual light of reconciling love. The cross makes it clear that, that this is a love that will go any distance for the sake of enemies. I wonder if one of the central reasons we gather for worship every week is, is because somewhere deep down we recognize, perhaps all the more especially in our current climate, 
We recognize that we have this fundamental need to stand under and to receive afresh this light, warming, melting, softening. Snow is good. Its touch is invigorating, enlivening, awakening even. But if you are living in a climate that is sub-zero most of the time, you have to shovel regularly lest that snow harden. And sometimes we fall behind. And so if you are gathered here today and recognize there is, there is anger or there is resentment or there is hatred that has accumulated over the course of days or months or years, and so it's, it's not easily swept away, may you this morning receive afresh the light of life that never ceases to pour forth with forgiveness and love. May you stand under that light and bask in that light for as long as it takes to notice a softening. And then, soften just so, just a little bit more flexible because of that light. Go ahead and put down whatever holy and important thing you may have going and pick up a bag of salt. It may be a prayer. It may be a blessing. It may be a gift. It may be a note. It may be the first step in a reconciliation. And use it in whatever direction Jesus is putting on your heart. That person from way back when? that family member right there in the room with you, those people on the other side of the aisle, but somewhere, pour salt. And the thing about salt is once you start pouring it onto ice, it has a way of melting both the spot where it hits as well as the surrounding Area. In other words, risk using salt. And while it may or may not go as we hope or we plan when we try to love our enemies, do pay attention nevertheless. More is melting than we might initially assume. And don't be surprised if some of the most significant melting is happening right here. Amen. We will now move into a time of prayer. As some of you may recall, we did not have our Ash Wednesday service over Zoom this past Wednesday, which means we did not do the litany of the burlap cross that was going to be part of the service of worship. Those of you who are our members received burlap crosses in the mail like this one. And since we couldn't do that litany there, we are going to do it now as, as the prayers of the people for this particular service of worship. And so if you have your burlap cross, I invite you to, to hold that during this prayer. I hope this prayer proves a way we can, can keep considering some of the themes of the sermon while also helping usher ourselves all the more fully into this season of Lent. As this is a litany, uh, it will be broken up into brief phrases of prayer, and then I'll leave just a couple moments of silent reflection, and then on to the next part of the litany, and it'll kind of move like that. But, but simply be aware that will be multiple times where you'll hear uh, a brief pause for continu continued silent and prayerful reflection. Let us pray. Merciful God, we hold this piece of burlap. We take a few moments and first note how light it is in our hands. And we are mindful again of how fragile and even fleeting life truly is. Teach us then to number our days that we might gain hearts of wisdom. We 
We take a few moments and notice the worn nature of this piece of burlap. And we receive the invitation to join with scripture and offer honestly before you our own tiredness. I am worn out and calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for God. We take a few moments and notice the incomplete nature of this piece of burlap, the visible holes throughout. We are made mindful of how incomplete we are as your people. As our fingers rub across all of these holes, we confess the failings, our sins, the ones we readily see and the ones we often cannot or do not see. We take a few moments and notice the rough texture. We are made mindful of the ways and times when we have let our hearts become callous, filled with judgments, distanced from others, gruff and resentful, even with family, neighbors. And we offer again our confession, lest our anger have even a moment to begin hardening. <clears throat> we take a few moments and notice the frayed edges. We are made mindful of the many times in these recent days when we have been stretched thin, frazzled, even torn. It makes us mindful of scripture's call to cast our anxieties fully upon you. And at this moment, we do just that. The longer we hold this burlap, the more we recognize it, that it draws forth not only reason for lament and confession, but also praise. We take a few moments and notice again how light it is in our hands. This time we're made mindful of the truth from 2 Corinthians. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And we give you thanks that no matter the affliction we face, it is truly light and momentary compared to what you are doing and the promise we have in you. We take a few moments and notice again the worn nature of this piece of burlap, but this time we give you thanks. We rejoice with the Apostle Paul who, that, that though, yes, we may be hard pressed on every side, we are not crushed. We may be perplexed, but we do not despair. We may be persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We may be struck down, but we are not destroyed. We take a few moments and notice again the incomplete nature of this piece of burlap, the visible holes throughout. But this time we are mindful of the truth that it is in our weakness that you are strong. It is actually through all of our holes that your light shines most fully. We take a few moments and notice again the rough texture. But this time we, we note that it is rough because it is a woven fabric, each strand intersecting with another, making the whole so much stronger. And we give you thanks that you have woven together this surprising and diverse people at First Presbyterian Georgetown, Texas, and that by your grace, our gifts intersect and overlap in ways that make for an enduring and beautiful strength. We take a few moments and notice again the frayed edges of this piece of burlap. This time we are made mindful that when we reach our limits, you begin. For the new beginnings that we have seen in our endings and for the new beginnings we yet anticipate, we give you thanks. And finally, we take a few moments to center our hearts upon the cross situated at the center 
of this piece of burlap. And we give thanks that by way of your cross, we are forgiven and reconciled as friends. By way of your cross, you have overcome the power of sin and evil. By way of the cross, you have shown us what it means to be salt and light. By way of the cross, you have assured us that you are present with us even in the deepest of darknesses. And by way of the cross, always you bring forth new life. We unfold our every prayer, our every praise into the singular prayer that you taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in worship by affirming our faith together. And this morning, our affirmation of faith comes from a portion of the Presbyterian Church's Book of Confessions, the Confession of Belhar. Let us Confess together what it is that we believe. We believe that God has entrusted the church with the message of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ. That the church is called to be the salt and light of the world. That the church is called blessed because it is a peacemaker. That the church is witness both by word and by deed to the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. That God's life-giving word and spirit has conquered the power of sin and death, and therefore also of irreconciliation and hatred, bitterness and enmity. That God's life-giving word and spirit will enable the church to live in a new obedience, which can open new possibilities of life for society and the world. Thanks be to God for such good news. And thank you. You all have continued to be exceedingly generous in the way you offer yourselves, your time, your energy, your financial gifts, your spiritual gifts. All of this and more continues to contribute to God's remarkable work in and through First Presbyterian Church, Georgetown, Texas. Thank you. As we continue in worship, you're invited to consider how the Holy Spirit is leading you in this time. To continue offering of yourself, um, offering of a uh, financial gift. Again, if you do that, you can always write a check to the church or you can give online on our website. As well, I invite you to use this time to continue discerning how the Holy Spirit is leading you to be salt for such a time as this. Let us continue in worship.
Gracious God, we give thanks for the light of life and forgiveness that bathes us day in and day out. We ask you to take our tithes, our gifts, our offerings as expressions of our, of our gratitude in light of this remarkable and steadfast grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the light of Jesus' life and forgiveness continue to pour forth upon you, that you might know the fullness of that warmth, that melting, that softening, that grace. And as you receive that grace, may you then be encouraged and empowered to offer yourselves as salt in this world, in whatever direction Jesus has put upon your heart. Go and be reconciled in that direction. Go and love an enemy or enemies in that direction. Go and offer yourselves as salt for such a time as this. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit hold you, keep you, and empower you this day and always. Amen.